Hey, let's do it for the content. Mega Ray. Let's go. Let's get it. Dick Kick City. It gets gritty when Mega Ray come through. The kid gets busy. Work yourself into a shoot, but you know it's legit. Like what you like, just don't be a dick. Hey, wrestling with regret. Let's get it. What's that set? Maybe you should bottle it. Drink it and spray it on. Get glowed to model it. Eight years in, can't look back. Who else can make the lost sweatsuits look whack? Wrestling with regret. Let's get it. Yeah. Well, folks, it's Survivor Series season, a pay-per-view synonymous with big debuts like Rocky Maivia or The Shield, or perhaps most notably, one of the greatest wrestling icons of all time, The Undertaker. He is Mr. 305. He is Mr. Worldwide. <sighs> When you've had a career as long and storied as Mark Calloway's, you're bound to have a few valleys along with your peaks, especially when your character has so much of that precious lore to dive into and exploit. Much like his brother Kane, The Undertaker has endured a lot of poor creative moves over the years. More often than not, these decisions were done with the goal in mind of making mean Mark look better than before, but not all of them worked. It's like I always say, nobody's perfect. I mean, look at Paul McCartney. He wrote Hey Jude and Temporary Secretary. Don't look it up, because I'm still trying to forget that awkward send-off ceremony they did at the Thunderdome last year. This week, I'm going to rank them. My picks for the top eight worst Undertaker moments. Number eight, the Ministry Era. With his cartoony and mystical origins, Take already had a hard time fitting into the gritty, more reality-based Attitude Era. But sometimes you just gotta double down. After admitting to killing his parents in a fire, trying to embalm Steve Austin alive, then totally not crucifying him, The Undertaker vanished for a few weeks after being buried alive at the end of 1998. He returned to TV looking like he just ran to the Spirit Halloween store on November 1st, gathering what he called his Ministry of Darkness. For weeks and months, fans of the dead man speak in tongues and other gibberish, while looking like a character from Manos the Hands of Fate and acting about as well to boot. The plague of darkness is coming, and all encompassing evil pain becomes synonymous with punishment. Taker made Dennis Knight drink his blood. He threatened Shane McMahon with a knife. He kidnapped and tried to marry a young Stephanie McMahon, all for it to be undone when it was revealed that he was working for Vince the entire time. It's me, Austin! Oh, son of a- It was far and away the most outlandish stuff viewers were seeing on Raw, which during that time period was definitely saying something, only now it was all totally undermined by Vincent Mann's reveal as the higher power. The big bad devil guy over here isn't the real psycho, but actually it's his boss, the 50-something year old man in the suits with the giant shoulder pads? What? By the summer of 99, Ministry Taker had been pushed so far to the edge he'd practically fallen off the table. The dead man left TV for months to tend to personal and physical issues before re-emerging as Biker Taker. This might be a polarizing statement, but the Ministry gimmick is probably one of the worst parts about the Attitude Era. Its biggest sin of all was going to such ridiculous lengths to get fans to boo one of the more popular wrestlers in the WWF. Number 7. The Undertaker and the Invasion Speaking of the American Badass gimmick, it's pretty prevalent in my coverage of the Invasion storyline 20 years later. Survivor Series 2001's coming next week, folks! But if there's one guy whose participation I'm not looking forward to seeing in that main event, it's Booger Red. In a storyline that had more lows than highs, no one was involved in more of the bad about the invasion than The Undertaker. For starters, he completely destroyed former world champion and amateur stalker Diamond Dallas Page in one of the most lopsided feuds of all time. DDP's arrival was one of the first huge moments of the entire angle, even though the idea of him stalking The Undertaker's wife in an attempt to make an impact seemed far-fetched. After expressing some creative differences, Taker spent the next couple of months beating the brakes off Page and ruining whatever value he may have had as a big name from WCW. Even Chris Canyon's stock went down after being pulled into the feud's orbit. More on him later. Then of course there was he and Kane's two-week feud with Bryans, Clark, and Adams, together known as Chronic. The former WCW tag champs were given a shot after The Undertaker vouched for them, then Unforgiven happened. The BOD vs. Chronic is widely considered to be one of the worst matches of 2001, if not worst of all. Bad wrestling, bad selling, bad communication, and a disinterested crowd made this one to behold. Maybe if DDP were still in the picture to teach Adams and Clark some stretches, they wouldn't look so stiff and clunky in the ring. The chronic experiment made everyone look terrible, and it was up in smoke the moment the final bell had rung. I wonder if Brian Adams' membership renewal form to the BSK got lost in the mail that year. 
Aside from those two huge red flags, the dead man's time during the invasion was spent making anybody from WCW look foolish and weak, perhaps more than just about anyone else from Team WWF. You can argue whether or not Biker Taker was as bad as the ministry phase, but this run in 2001 could make for a convincing argument. Number 6. The Streak Ends let me first say that I've always thought the streak was meant to be broken, and I'm not even mad it was Brock Lesnar who did it. It's just when you take a step back and look at the whole package, you wonder, was it all worth it? After holding back challengers like Shawn Michaels, Triple H, and CM Punk in consecutive manias, it seemed like a foregone conclusion that the trend would continue against Lesnar at WrestleMania 30. That the build for the match was so underwhelming and at times dated also made it come off like the same old song and dance. Then the bell rang, and so did The Undertaker's early in the match. Because of that concussion, it's safe to say the match was not up to the standard set in the last five years. And what's worse is, by the time the streak was broken, that was pretty much all Taker had left going for him. He wasn't going to win any more world titles, and certainly wasn't going to go back to work on a full-time schedule. Without the streak to rely on as a selling point, every rare match of The Undertaker thereafter was just a match. And as we'll learn later in this countdown, he didn't have many of those left in him either. Number 5. The Concrete Crypt Match At WrestleMania 20 in Madison Square Garden, fans were delighted to see The Undertaker eschew the biker gimmick in favor of something a little closer to his original persona. And as a bonus, Paul Bear, the man who guided most of Taker's first decade of destruction, returned as part of the package. But after the initial nostalgia buzz wore off, it was becoming apparent that a return to performing and life back on the road was taking its toll on Bear, who had gained an unhealthy amount of weight in the four years since he'd been gone from television. On top of that, Taker didn't exactly have a large swath of quality guys to feud with after his mania return, which led to an awkward feud between he and Paul Heyman vis-a-vis -vis the Dudley boys' hired guns. The Dudleys had kidnapped Bear and stole the urn, forcing Taker to do Heyman's bidding for a while. But when the dead man got sick of that, Heyman set up a concrete crypt match for the Great American Bash. The manager was trapped in a glass case that would fill up with cement if the Undertaker refused to lay down for the Dudleys. Just saying, if I were Bubba or Devon, and the guy who hired hired us had so little faith in our ability to take out one guy without him taking some other guy hostage, I'd be a little offended. The match went on, and after a few teases with the lever, Taker not only beat the Dudleys, but kept Heyman from killing off Percy Pringle. Wow, who would have guessed that rules don't matter in wrestling? But instead of rescuing his old friend, Take inexplicably pulled the lever and killed Paul himself for about six years. He later explained he just had to kill off his mentor because he was becoming too much of a liability and needed to be taken out of the picture so the darkness could be set loose or whatever the fuck. You know what? The more I say it out loud, the more I wonder how were we meant to ever cheer for this guy afterward. I mean, you killed a guy, man, the fuck? Number four, did he really want to hurt him? In February 2003, the big show was Duck and the Undertaker, who had returned from being written off by him months prior. Show and Paul Heyman spent weeks playing mind games with the dead man via gifts. We saw Brother Love, we saw a puppy, then there was this bizarre peace offering. Do you really wanna make me cry? It was Canyon, the former Alliance member who had been MIA for months after a series of health issues, was finally back on TV, dressed as Boy George for some reason. <laughs> How original. Tony Falk says hi. In late 2001, Canyon pitched an idea to creative for him to come out as gay through WWE so he could be a character more based on himself. They rejected the idea, but then later had him dress up as a different gay man and be really flamboyant because, haha, <laughs> gay! The big choice, we, 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 sorry! So did The Undertaker really want to hurt him? Well, after giving him some of the nastiest chair shots I've ever seen for what was basically a throwaway segment on TV, you tell me. Chris later claimed that a producer specifically told him to sound more like a, a word for a bundle of sticks, but was that what he was really going for there? I always assumed it was just a really awful take in an English accent. No disrespect. At one time, he also believed the skit was some kind of punishment for him being gay, and while he later admitted to friends that probably wasn't the case, the beatdown does line up with WWE's unfortunate track record with queer-coded characters over the years. And even so, the severity with which Taker swung that chair around makes this an uncomfortable piece of wrestling history in a number of ways. Number 3. Giant Gonzalez 
Like they did with Hulk Hogan, the WWF strategy with The Undertaker as a babyface was to put him against over-the-top monsters to make his heroics that much more impressive. But while the Hulkster got the top-tier baddies like King Kong Bundy, the One Man Gang, and Andre the Giant, Taker was often saddled with guys like the Berserker, Papa Shango, and most notably, Giant Gonzalez. Formerly Ellie Gante in WCW, the basketball player turned wrestler became the apple of Vincent Mann's eye. He seemed tailor-made for wrestling, or rather a style of wrestling that was fast falling out of favor. By 1993, just being big wasn't good enough. WrestleMania 9 is often regarded as... Hmm. Is regarded the right word? Um, no, derided. That's the word I was looking for. Derided as one of the worst of all time. And this match here is a big reason as to why. I've said it enough times and in enough ways in this channel that Taker vs. Gonzalez at WrestleMania is really bad and that's all you really need to know. What you don't often hear about is that this feud actually carried on until SummerSlam when The Undertaker came out on top in a rest in peace match. A stipulation I'm still not 100% sure as to what it actually is. Number two his last few years in general. It seems that ever since losing at WrestleMania 30, the Lord of Darkness has been in pursuit of a perfect send-off to end his career on a high note. He probably couldn't have had a more ideal final moment than at the end of Mania 33 in Orlando when he seemingly passed the torch to Roman Reigns and rode off into the sunset. But the dead man hated how he looked in the ring in that match and refused to give up until he made up for it. Which, as we all know, took a very long time. He came back for a piddly squash against John Cena at WrestleMania 34 that was never made official until the show started. Then later that year came the trip to Saudi Arabia, the match that brought Shawn Michaels out of retirement, and 28 minutes later sent him and everyone else involved scurrying back in embarrassment. The following year, Taker went from his mortality being exposed to it being downright threatened against Goldberg in Saudi Arabia. The match saw Bill knock himself silly, then nearly kill Taker by dropping him on his head on a jackhammer attempt. But don't worry, because Taker gave him a receipt. Then after a brief partnership with Roman Reigns against Shane McMahon and Drew McIntyre, in came AJ Styles like a knight in shining spandex to finally give Taker the exit he so desired, but we'll save that for another countdown. Sadly, Taker did the one thing he said he didn't want to do. He hung around for too long, which is how he ended up with the Boneyard match, which was awesome, and his send-off in the Thunderdome, which was super weird. It's easy to blame it solely on Taker, but these stumblings also fall at the feet of WWE, who might not have had to rely on him for as long as they have if they'd done a better job creating more stars in the decade prior. And my pick for the number one worst Undertaker moment of all time is Undertaker vs. Undertaker. Over the course of his career, it becomes standard for Mean Mark to take the occasional sabbatical, but the way he went about his first one might be the most bizarre of all. At the casket match between Taker and Yokozuna at the 1994 Royal Rumble, our hero was mobbed by a band of heels who came to the aid of the big man, helping him win the match. Undertaker responded by not only hacking into the video system, but also ascending to the heavenly bliss of the rafters. Drawing on the Elvis is Alive craze of the late 80s, viewers began seeing testimonials from everyone from the butcher to the baker to the candlestick maker describing their encounters with the dead man. These vignettes were as funny, or perhaps more accurately, unfunny as you'd expect. The hearse goes by, or falls out the back of the coffin, right in the middle of the street. The guy sits up, it's The Undertaker. Eventually, Ted DiBiase began claiming The Undertaker had returned to his evil roots. To DiBiase's credit, his under-faker, played by Brian Lee, almost even fooled Paul Bear. But when he wouldn't bow to the urn, he knew something was rotten in Death Valley. But seriously, I don't care how clever the camera work or the makeup was to try and hide everything, it's borderline insulting to have these grown men pretend that this obvious fake could possibly be The Undertaker. Then Paul Bearer presumably hired Leslie Nielsen, Detective Frank Drebin himself, to go looking for the real dead man. Either that or Nielsen was just doing research on goth lifestyles for his role in Dracula dead and loving it. It finally came to a head at SummerSlam. Taker versus Taker. Boy, if only memes were around back in 94. Here's a little secret. The Undertaker wasn't always the stellar worker he'd been built up to be in those matches with guys like Shawn Michaels and Triple H. During this part of his career, he was just a big, lumbering, slow zombie character who rarely sold anything. And now, there were two of him. Yay! Not only was the build silly, not only was the match bad because of a complete lack of contrast and style, but what made it even worse was it had to follow that epic steel cage match with Bret and Owen Hart for the WWF title. It's gone down in history as one of the worst and most botched WWE main events, both in concept and execution. For being possibly the worst match and probably the worst feud in his career, The Undertaker vs. The Undertaker belongs on his epitaph as the worst Undertaker moment. 
What other angles or moments did I miss? Let me know in the comment section below. I'm Brian Zane, and you will rest in peace. Oh, God. Oh, it still hurts. Oh, it still hurts.